Home Farm Bureau people this last week, and they, they're very emotional about this whole thing. You heard what uh, Senator Bond said about the, he was using the 2,000 acre farm. We don't have that many 2,000 acre farms, but, but I'm sure you can scale it down a little bit. Do you agree with his figures at, in Missouri? And that was taken from the Ag Policy Research Institute of uh, up to $30,000 per farm. Yeah, we see that report just came out. We see no reason to dispute that. Obviously, they use probably slightly different assumptions than we did in, in calculating our aggregate uh, net loss numbers <laughs> for agriculture. But uh, those seem very reasonable in terms of what you could expect at the producer level. You know, I went over and met with the uh, Farmers Co-op Regional Group on Friday. They were meeting over in, in Arkansas. And one of the things that concerns him the most is how, you know, we haven't talked about the specifics, but how intensive it is in terms of the agriculture um, that is in, in uh, uh, fuel, electricity, fertilizer, chemicals. In corn, it's 71 percent of the operating costs are fuel, electricity, or, or fertilizer. Soybeans, 50 percent. Wheat, 72 percent. Uh, barley, 69 percent. Um, I assume that we have communicated these, the, this to our, your membership, that they recognize the magnitude of this thing. Well, absolutely, and that is what generates the basic concern we have about the, the whole bill with respect to what it does to energy costs, because on average across the country, 20 percent of our input costs have some relationship to energy. And we're concerned, even though we're a strong renewable energy supplier in this country, which is positive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we still have to deal with the impacts of any future increase in energy costs. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this question. The chairman talked about the National Wheat, Wheat Growers Association, uh, and I don't understand how they could be supporting this when all of the large wheat states, or, or many of them, are on the other side of this issue. The North Dakota Wheat Commission, the Oklahoma Wheat Growers Association, the Texas Wheat Producers Association. I wonder why they don't get together with their national association. Any ideas? Well, I hesitate to speak for other groups, Senator. Uh, I know the National Association's position. I also know the concern that has been expressed to me personally by our members who are large wheat growers. So I do not know where the disconnect lies. Uh, I do know that from an economic perspective, we can show uh, no analysis that indicates that even with a liberal offsets policy, that the, in, the income from that would offset the increased cost. I see. And has it ever occurred to you that we asked the question, what are we doing here after last week when the director of the EPA, in response to my question as to what effect would it have if we unilaterally here in the United States have a cap and trade, have passed the, the bill, such as and we used as an example the Markey Waxman bill. Uh, what, what, what would that have, what effect would that have on the overall worldwide reduction in CO2? And our response was it wouldn't have. Now, if that's the case, and I agree with her, I don't agree with everything that she says, I certainly agree with that. And if we have statements such as we do have from the leaders in China and in India and in other countries saying under no circumstances are they going to accept any kind of mandatory reduction, what are we doing here? Well, that's a question we also raise. Uh, when we were over on the House side working on the bill and the legislative process, the rationale that was given, well, the U.S. has to show leadership by passing national legislation before we go into the Copenhagen talks. Well, I've been involved in international trade negotiations. Leadership usually means that the U.S. is supposed to give up something in favor of other countries. But there's no reason uh, to uh, have to have a bill passed this uh, bill passed by this well, Congress to go over to negotiate. You can do that without having legislation passed, as most countries are doing. Yeah, there are a lot of people who uh, believe that the concept, and we heard this, of course, from uh, so Senator Alexander. I don't agree with him in this case, but that uh, anthropogenic gases cause global warming. But there are a lot of them who actually believe that and still think that this is a disaster, and I'm using the words of, uh, of uh, James Hansen, Dr. Hansen, who's been one of the, he's Mr. Uh, greenhouse Gas, I guess you'd call him, 
He said, quote, the fact that the climate course set by Waxman Markey is a disaster course. Their bill is an astoundingly inefficient way to get a tiny reduction of emissions. It's less than worthless because it will delay by at least a decade starting on a path that is fundamentally sound from the standpoint of both economics and climate preservation. Now here's the guy that's on the other side, the leader on the other side. He was here, uh, I guess it was yesterday. In, in Washington. So I don't know, you look at these things and I look at them from an Oklahoma perspective and wonder, you know, if it's not going to make any change and if the countries are, in spite of what they say about leadership, if the leaders are saying under no circumstances are we going to do it, period. Anyway, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you.